As we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture passage comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They, Jesus and the disciples, went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Austrian writer Rainer Maria Rilke is best known for his intense poetry and volumes of correspondence, including Letters to a Young Poet. But years ago, I came across a book of children's stories by Rilke titled Stories of God. The first story begins when the narrator runs into a neighbor and inquires after her two daughters. You know, the neighbor responds, they have both reached the age, these children, when they ask all day long, what? All day long and right straight through the night. Yes, the narrator murmurs, there is a time, but the neighbor takes no notice. And not just questions such as, where does this horse car go? And how many stars are there? And is 10,000 more than many? quite different things as well. For example, does God speak Chinese too? And what does God look like? Always, everything about God. But that's something we ourselves don't know about. No, of course, the narrator agrees, though we can have our guesses. Asking questions is one of the ways we learn about the world and the people around us. And while children are notorious for asking questions, something tends to happen to many of us, if not all of us, as we grow and learn. We become hesitant to ask our questions. We've all probably had a teacher at some point say, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. But the truth is, Sometimes asking a question, especially in front of a group of people, makes us feel uncomfortable and insecure. In today's passage, we hear the second of three so-called passion predictions that Jesus makes in Mark's gospel. Each time, Jesus tells the disciples exactly what's going to happen to him when they get to Jerusalem. He will be betrayed, he will be killed, and then he will rise again. Clearly, the disciples don't understand what Jesus is talking about. And how could they? They were just starting to grasp that Jesus might be more than a brilliant teacher and miracle worker. In chapter eight, Peter correctly identifies Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. At the beginning of chapter 9, before today's story, three of the disciples go up on a mountain and see Jesus transfigured. So the disciples are beginning to grasp that Jesus is unique and that he might even be the Messiah God's people have anxiously awaited to set them free from the Roman oppressors. 
But that's the kind of Messiah they expected, a warrior, a liberator, not someone who gets betrayed and killed. And rise again? What could that possibly mean? The disciples were filled with questions, but they were also confused and afraid. And in their fear and anxiety and uncertainty, they kept quiet. They didn't ask Jesus what his prediction really meant. The science fiction writer Theodore Sturgeon was a fierce believer in the power of questions. In an article titled, Ask the Next Question, Sturgeon writes, Every advance this species has ever made is the result of someone somewhere looking at his world, his neighborhood, his neighbor, his cave, or himself, and asking the next question. Every deadly error this species has committed, every sin against itself and its high destiny is the result of not asking the next question or of not listening to those who do ask it. Although at first they may not seem directly related, the disciples' fear of asking the next question is directly correlated to their argument over the petty issues of rank and status. As one commentator puts it, when the disciples avoid asking hard questions, they focus on posturing about who is right. Today is Ash Wednesday, when we reflect honestly and soberly on our own brokenness. And sometimes, like the disciples in this story, our brokenness includes our tendency to avoid asking hard questions and to instead spend our time posturing to the notion that greatness is all about status, wealth, and achievement. On Ash Wednesday, we name that notion as the lie it is. We remember that we are human. We are mortal. We are broken. And we follow Jesus, who shows us throughout his life that greatness does not come from proving that we are superior to others, but from willingly choosing the path of descent by associating, just as Jesus did, with the least and the lost and the last. This is the point Jesus makes when he says to his disciples, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. To illustrate this point, he puts a child in front of them and continues, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. In the ancient world, children weren't just vulnerable because they depended on adults for survival. Children had no legal protection, no status, no rights. They were, physically and culturally, the lowest of all people, with nothing to offer anyone in terms of honor and status, which meant as much, if not more, in that culture than in ours. So for Jesus to tell his disciples who've just been arguing about which one of them is the greatest, that to welcome him, they must welcome a lowly child, this turns all their ideas about greatness upside down. We all know what it's like when our human obsession with power and privilege engulfs our childlike curiosity to keep asking the next question. We've seen it again and again in our par partisan politics, which feature seemingly endless posturing over solutions to a problem while those in need of the solution suffer and wait. We see it in the way our fear leads us to demonize those with whom we disagree, so that instead of asking the next question, which might just be, can you tell me more about why you see it that way? We end up trading talking points and leaving more frustrated than we began. 
We began this season of Lent by marking our foreheads with the sign of our mortality, the sign of the cross. In doing so, we humble ourselves, as Jesus has invited us to do, by admitting that we don't have it all figured out, that we are not as great as our achievements might lead us to believe, and that we need God and we need one another. A couple of weeks ago, a colleague recommended that I listen to three lectures given by the Reverend Dr. Scott Black Johnston, who is the pastor of Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City. Johnston gave these talks virtually as this year's Thomas White Curry Lecturer at Austin Presbyterian Seminary. He titled them Good News for the Great Awakening," and I cannot recommend them highly enough. Johnston compares the current cultural moment to historic periods of cultural awakening in this country. He describes this moment as the Great Awakening, which differs from earlier awakenings because those earlier ones were rooted in spiritual and theological convictions and often emerged from the church. Whereas today, the big ethical conversations are beginning not in the church, but in a cultural conversation that is often fixated on the idea of wokeness. In the third lecture, Johnston offers thoughts on how the church can claim a meaningful place as one of the advancers of moral and ethical conversation in a culture that seems hopelessly divided. He considers the centrality of confession and repentance in our tradition as one of the most important practices we can offer, saying this. The core teachings of Christianity, Christianity also encourage us to engage others, to expand the tent, to broaden the conversation. Every week, in facing our own brokenness and our complicity in the world's moral failings, the faithful lean into a paradigm modeled by Jesus and his disciples. It goes like this. Difficult ethical conversations are more than a zero-sum game, a tooth-and-nail battle fought by enemy tribes. Difficult ethical conversations are a vital crucible in which understandings can dawn, opinions can be changed, souls can be saved, reconciliation forged, and surprising relationships grow. The vital crucible of difficult conversations depends on our willingness to push past our fear and insecurity and be willing to keep asking questions. Because on this journey of life and of faith, questions keep the conversation going. Yes, asking questions will require us to humble ourselves, to admit that we don't have it all figured out, to expose our ignorance and reveal gaps in our understanding, but to ask the next question and the next and the next is how we open ourselves to someone different from us. It is, in Jesus' words, how we welcome one another, how we see ourselves not as greater than someone else, but as needing and wanting to better understand another human being who is struggling, just like we are, to keep going on the journey of life and faith. The author Kelly Corrigan once attended a work dinner and sat next to a small older man in an ill-fitting blazer. The evening started off brutally boring. The conversation just could not get traction. But then someone mentioned Cambodia, and Kelly's husband asked the man they were sitting next to if he'd ever been there. Yes, the man said. After spending several years as a political prisoner in Madagascar, 31 months, one cell, rats everywhere. Suddenly, everyone had questions for the man, 
and those at the table discovered he was an undefeated boxing and judo champion, filed 40 patents, and was suing the Dallas Cowboys for using his retractable roof design without permission. George Clooney had just optioned the rights to the man's life story. Later that evening, Kelly's husband said to her, makes you wonder what else people might tell you if you just keep asking questions. Our theme for this season of Lent is keep going. When this journey of following Jesus gets hard, and it will, don't give up. Today's lesson in keeping going is to keep asking questions. Questions of yourself, of your loved ones, of the person who drives you crazy, of your enemy, and yes, even of God. Keep asking, for when we do, we humble ourselves before one another. Keep asking. Who knows what stories we might hear. Amen.